What is up everyone? Welcome to part two. Today is finally the time where we get to power this stuff up and configure it all. So I'm going to take you through every single step of the journey. First time setup of both of these pieces of equipment, the NAS and the switch, and all of the configuration that needs to take place to get a setup like this up and running and in a functional state. So by the end of this video, you guys should see me editing to and from this NAS over a fairly speedy network, hopefully, if everything goes to plan. So let's give it a go. Never done this before. Let's learn together. It's going to be loads and loads of fun. all the kit behind me it's time to power it up quick little reminder first we've got the new nas the new switch 10 gig link between these two the new switch is connected to my current switch so this stuff has become part of my same network and we also have a third cable coming from the new switch so we will be able to connect directly with 10 gig ethernet with my main machine now here's the other end of that cable and for those of you who know i've got a mac mini m1 and it famously doesn't have 10 gig ethernet not even as an option so that's quite a shame but not a huge deal because we can use a simple adapter like this you take your rj45 plug it in and then on the other end we have a handy little USB-C. Little USB-C cable goes in and then you have Thunderbolt or USB 4, I guess they're calling it now, to 10 gig networking. If you're on the PC side, if you've got a desktop, it's even easier because you can just plug in any kind of 10 gig PCI card that you find off eBay. So you're completely sorted. But anyway, let's get this stuff powered on. So for the switch, we'll just plug it into power. Not sure if you can see that on camera. There's a little green light that has popped on and is now flashing because the switch is booting up. Now, it doesn't matter what order we do any of this in, we can just fire it all up. I'm just making it all dramatic because I'm very excited and I want to prolong the experience. So next up, let's power on the NAS. Power button on the front, here we go. Three, two, one, and she's come to life. All the LEDs gave a nice flash. I can hear the drive spinning up. Little beep. I guess that means it's booting up. So this is my existing network cable to the Mac Mini. We've unplugged that just to avoid any kind of confusion. We only want the one new network connection connected to the machine to set all this up. That way we know exactly what's going on. So let's plug in our USB-C cable. Now, if you've got an older Mac Mini or a different machine entirely, um, you may have onboard networking and then this step isn't required whatsoever. But for the majority of Mac users, an adapter will be necessary. So I'll put some links to some options for adapters down in the video description. So there we go. We've got some LEDs on the adapter to show that that is connected. We'll just plop that there for now. None of this is permanent. It's all just gonna be there until we get this finalized. So we now have an activity LED for our Mac mini as well, which is connected to the final port on the switch, port number eight. Noticeably, we have no activity on port one. We're using a DAC cable, direct attach copper cable from my existing switch to this switch. Now, I'm not actually 100% sure that in my setup, this is going to work as I expect because my existing switch does not have any SFP plus ports. It only has standard SFP ports, which are one gigabit per second ports. Now, equipment can get a bit fussy when connecting SFP to SFP plus. It is totally possible, and I'm in fact doing that with some of my existing equipment, but it sometimes takes a couple of extra steps. So what I'm gonna do at this stage is log onto my switch, see what's going on, see if the port is active, possibly restart the switch and see if I can get some activity using this cable between the two switches. So unfortunately, I can't get these two switches to communicate with this DAC cable. So we'll look into that a little closer later on in the video. We are for now gonna use a normal RJ45 cable because if I plug this in, it should just work straight away. I'm not gonna mess around. Because we have the free available ports, I'm not gonna mess around trying to get this to work when I know we could be here for quite some time trying to get it to work. So let's just connect it in a more straightforward way. I'm gonna pull out one of my cables 
from the existing network here, plug this right in and run the other end up to the switch. We have an activity LED for that port that we just plugged in. Before we start configuring this stuff, we need to actually check that we're up and running on the network and everything is working properly. Because we've connected our machine in a brand new way, we just need to see that that connection is physically working. So let's dive into the network preference pane and take a look at what's going on. And we can see right away, we are connected with the new adapter. We can tell because it states it's a Thunderbolt ethernet adapter. We've also been assigned an IP address via DHCP. So that is absolutely perfect. Everything is up and running. So in theory, everything on my network should be as normal. And indeed it is. I can see my three existing servers right there. And because of that, we should have internet connectivity. There we go. Google.com up and running, no problem whatsoever. So we are ready to start configuring our NAS. It's that simple. We haven't touched the switch yet. Even though it is a managed switch, we don't need to configure any additional settings right out of the box. It will work as just a normal switch. And then those settings are there for later on if you do need them. Of course, we could dive into the switch right now and start configuring things if we wanted to alter anything. But I think a good place to start would be the NAS because right now all we need is to be able to communicate with it. And that is what the switch is currently doing for us. So QNAP actually have this funky little app that finds any QNAP devices on your network. It is called QFinder Pro and I've installed it on my Mac. You guys can see it's just a nice little application. And there we have it. Both machines are indeed listed. So we have the NAS and we have the switch. Right away, it recognizes that we have a NAS on the network that is not yet configured. And it's just popped up asking us if we'd like to go through the setup and we will go for yes. So it's now opened a browser window and the rest of the setup will be conducted through the browser, which is perfect. We do have another little notification here flashing away. QFinder is also warning us that SMTP is not currently set up. We're not gonna do that right away. We'll do that later on. We'll just go for the configuration of the NAS right now. So we're gonna start the smart installation. There is an option here to switch to a different OS. So currently we're on, welcome to QUTS Hero. So this is their most advanced operating system, supports ZFS. This is, as I mentioned in part one, a ZFS NAS. Uh, but you can switch to standard QTS if you do want to. Now, I'm a new QNAP user. I may as well dive all in and go straight for QUTS Hero and go for that configuration and setup. So right away, it's going to look for new firmware for the device, and it has indeed found a new version. So we will, of course, update that to the latest before we continue with the setup. So you get a couple of audible little beeps while the NAS is busy restarting and booting up and doing different things. And on our screen, we can see that it's restarting and there's a little bit of a countdown. It's gonna reconnect automatically. So just sitting here waiting for this to finish. And once we're up and running with the new firmware, we will be able to carry on with the installation. So the new firmware is now presumably all installed and we are up and running. So let's see what happens this time. And we are ready. We are in the setup process. So I have a sort of Doctor Who theme, naming theme going on with all of my devices, my servers, and I'm going to continue the trend. Now, this is likely to be the speediest, most capable NAS I'm ever going to own, at least in the next kind of foreseeable future. So... I'm gonna go right for the big one. I'm gonna call this Gallifrey. Now, it's completely up to you guys what you call your NAS. It doesn't have to be sci-fi related, obviously, but for me, the Doctor Who naming structure is good fun. Next up, we're gonna enter our password. Um, I'm not gonna use the suggested password from Safari, just because for now, we wanna put a really straightforward password in for us to recognize quickly. Um, pretty okay security on that one, but we will change that later on. Once we get into the account section, this is just for the default admin account. Um, presumably later on, if it's like the other NAS equipment I've used, you'll just be able to add as many users as you like later on at any point. So that is perfect. Let's go next. So for time, we're already synchronized with an NTP server by default, and it's found the correct time zone. So that's absolutely perfect for us. Aha, now we're getting into the good stuff. So we have the option right away in the setup wizard to set up our static IP. Uh, we're gonna actually leave it as DHCP for now. We'll change it later on. And the reason for that is because currently my entire machine is actually on the wrong network. I've got multiple VLANs set up 
and currently we're not on the correct one because I've plugged into a random Ethernet port on the front of one of my switches. Um, that's something that we need to go over later, but that's kind of specific to my setup. For anybody watching this, that doesn't know the difference between the dynamic and the static IP address. And it really is a good idea if you can get it up and running to go for a static IP address. Uh, if you know this information and you wanna give yourself a static IP, it's great because you will always have the same IP. You'll be able to access your server no matter what happens. Less issues will present themselves down the road um, if you use a static IP over using a dynamic address. But we're gonna stick with DHCP for now until we get it configured a little bit better later on. So we'll focus on that in a different part of the video for now, we'll stick with this. This is the section where we get to tell the NAS what systems we're gonna be connecting with primarily. That way the NAS can put services in place to allow us to connect to those systems in the most efficient way possible. So by default, we've got Windows and Mac checked here. I'm actually gonna uncheck Windows. I will never ever connect to this NAS from a Windows machine. Um, we're gonna talk about the difference between AFP and SMB a little bit later on. We only really need to use SMB MB for this setup because this is going to be a video editing NAS for us and I'm a Final Cut user. SMB is recommended. So we only need to tick this little Mac one here and that is good enough for us. And then we have our summary of all of the settings. So we've set up our user account. We've set up the time that was set up anyway for us. We have still a DHCP uh, dynamic IP address and we want the Mac services. Let's finish off by applying these settings. So at this stage, this is interesting. So at this stage, this is when we will lose our data. So if we were putting used drives or drives that had data on them in the NAS, this little dialogue here is telling us that this is possibly where we can lose our data here while we initialize the system. So we've got brand new drives. That is not a problem. Safari is asking if I want to save this password in my keychain. We are not gonna do that. And here we go. It's applying the settings to the NAS and it's doing so extremely quickly. So we are done, congratulations. Let's go to NAS management. So, okay, so we'll log in with our admin account, which is the only account on the machine currently. That was really quite speedy, by the way, just a few minutes, but we haven't set up any of our storage yet. So that's one thing to keep in mind. That's just the initial setting up of the machine. Privacy notice, let's go. Loading. Here we are at the QUTS Hero desktop. So, wow, nice. First time, it's gonna give me a little guided tour through the OS, it seems. So here we are, we've had loads of stuff thrown at us here. Um, we've got a few different windows. It looks like we can only click, oh no, we can click on any window, that's cool. So that's like a help page. So this little window here details the snapshots feature, which appears to be very similar to something like Time Machine. So you can revert back to any point on your NAS or just retrieve a file from a previous snapshot and it'll only save the changed file. So any files that you've modified or files that you've added, it won't just keep replicating the files with each snapshot. So it's not like a clone backup, it's a block-based backup. So that's really cool. Um, we will of course set up snapshots as well. Right here, it's telling us a little bit about backing up the snapshots or saving the snapshots to a different NAS entirely or a different storage pool. This is quite cool. So if you've got an older NAS, maybe you're upgrading from an older one and you're replacing it with a quicker one, you could then repurpose that older one for backup and it could save your snapshots. Um, or you could, in the future, buy a lower powered machine, something not quite as quick, but then you could use it in the future for snapshots. That's really quite cool. Or you could just use a different storage pool. It's quite interesting the way that the OS just sort of throws all this up here for you to look at, but it's all relevant. So this has now left us with the overview of our disks. We can see our disks that are installed in the machine. Let's see what this is. This is just a help section. I think we can close it. We're here to help. We'll try and figure this out by ourselves. This is talking about some additional licenses that you can purchase. We won't show that again, we'll close that. Okay, cool. We can see that all five of our drives are recognized and they are all the same model, WD, Red Pro, uh, 10 terabytes. So it's seeing it as a 9.1 terabyte disc. We have five of them and then we have our two SSDs in the top two slots and then we have two free SSD slots as well.
Let's have a bit of a recap of where we are now. So we have our NAS up and running on the network. We know the switch is working. We can communicate with the NAS. We've set up our admin account and the NAS is now booted to the operating system latest firmware version. We're sat here on the desktop and it's time to further configure the system so we can actually use it. I think what we'll do is make that storage pool, create the storage pool so that we know where we stand. We actually have a storage pool on the system. It's basically a case of taking all of these separate disks that we now have sitting in our NAS physically and creating one giant disk out of all of them with a few different options thrown in the mix. So let's have a little look. Now, one really cool thing about the ZFS NAS is we can store stuff directly on the storage pool. With other NAS systems um, that I've used in the past, we have to create the storage pool, then we have to create a volume, and then depending on the hardware, sometimes there's some limitations as to what you can do with the volumes. And then you have to make your shares and you can you can store things on, on the shares that are stored on the volumes. And it's sort of this kind of big kind of layer of, it's basically like a big cake all these different layers. With ZFS, you can store directly on the storage pool, much quicker access. And for that reason, it means that you get quicker behavior in things like RAID rebuilding. It'll go a lot quicker on a system with ZFS like this NAS. So let's have a little look at creating this storage pool. A storage pool combines many disks into one pool of storage space. So that is a much kind of more refined way of explaining what I just explained. So let's go ahead and create our storage pool. So here in the list, we can see all of our different drives that are in the system right now. So we have seven out of nine drive bays populated. You can see this little drop down here. I believe this is here um, for possibly if you have an expansion connected to the NAS, then you would be able to select it here and then it would tell you how many bays were populated in the expansion. So if you add that unit in the future, you can dive back in here and create another storage pool with your expansion. We of course just have the NAS itself, so we only have one option here. Further on down we have the list of drives. So first of all we have all of our hard drives and this will actively calculate the amount of space we are going to have. So let's select all five of our hard drives. So one, two, three, four and five. After selecting some drives it automatically selects a RAID type for us. What's cool is the RAID types that we can't use are greyed out. Another nice thing about this process as well is if you're unsure of what RAID type does what, then there is a little description here. So we could put this guy in RAID 0 if we wanted to get our maximum capacity and speed. But then, of course, if a drive dies, we are in trouble. We can't retrieve any of that data. Now, it's kind of, for me, a choice between RAID 5 or RAID 6. RAID 5 will allow for a single disk failure. So if you select RAID 5, build up a storage pool, and then two of your drives die simultaneously, or a drive dies during a rebuild, then you've lost all of your data. RAID 6 gives you a little bit of a better safety net because you can have two drives fail. Uh, but it is at the expense of a little bit of read speed. So for us, RAID 5 is where we want to be. And particularly in my case as well, I've got other systems that I can offload data onto. Now, RAID is not by any means a backup. Um, it's just a nice little bit of security to have. You can have a failed disk, you can pop it out, it'll rebuild, job done. But that is no replacement for a real backup. So for me, this will get backed up nightly to another one of my systems anyway, so I'm not too worried about RAID 5, only one disk failure. Heck, you know, maybe I, if I was living really on the edge, I'd go for RAID 0, but then it is really inconvenient if a disk does die. So we'll go for RAID 5. Nice and safe, good, safe, reliable option. Very common RAID type to be used on general purpose for all sorts of different tasks. Um, for video editing, this should give us enough speed. There is a difference of approximately 10 terabytes between selecting RAID 6 and RAID 5. So to get us that little bit of extra security with another disk, we're looking at losing 10 terabytes there. So we get a nice well-rounded capacity of around 35 terabytes when using RAID 5. That is a nice lot of storage. We've got this little tip down here telling us to select SSDs if we want to improve the performance of the storage pool. Now, I believe if we do that at this stage, it's not going to quite achieve what we want to achieve. So if we select these SSDs, yes. 
our total capacity of the storage pool drops dramatically, just over two terabytes. So we don't want to combine the SSDs with the mechanical drives on the storage pool, not at this stage. We wanna use the SSDs later on for caching and we will set, set that up separately, I believe. So deselecting the SSDs and swapping back to a RAID 5, this is exactly how we want it. All five of our hard drives selected, no SSDs. Let's continue to the next step. The system will assign this storage pool as the system pool. Selecting SSDs will improve system pool and general system performance. Do you want to change your disk selection? Now, at this stage, with these kind of pop-ups, I am definitely no expert here. Now, I presume that setting up the storage pool on the hard drives is the best thing to do because that's our mass storage, and then selecting the SSDs as a cache, that makes the most sense because like we saw when we selected the SSDs, uh, yes, it may improve the speed of the storage pool, but you're looking at two widely different kinds of disks, SSD versus hard drive, 500 gig versus 10 terabyte. It just makes no sense to put them all in one storage pool, and I can't see how that will really benefit us in the long run. So we're gonna ignore these messages and we will set up the SSDs later on. Could be the wrong step, maybe I'll find out later on down the road, but for now I'm gonna set it up in the way that I think is the best way to set it up, and we'll go from there. So we have a couple of options to configure on the next page. Interestingly, by default, we have over-provisioning enabled, and it's allocated at 10% of our storage pool, so that equates to 3.51 terabytes, quite a lot of space there. Uh, to my knowledge, over-provisioning is really only necessary when working with SSDs to prolong their lifespan, um, giving the SSD a 10% swap space. So really, I don't think we need to enable over-provisioning for this storage pool. So we were talking about snapshots earlier when that pop-up came up. This option is to enable pool guaranteed snapshot space. It's currently set to 20%. I think this is a good amount of space for us to begin with. I think we can change that later on anyway. Um, but we won't be storing our snapshots outside of this QNAP box. We'll probably be backing up from it in a slightly different way, maybe. I'll have to see how that all pans out. So for now, we'll just leave this at default. That means that there's definitely guaranteed space for snapshots, so for those copies of those old deleted files uh, on the system itself. We can see a little illustration of this here, and it notes as well that snapshots will be automatically deleted when it becomes full. So when space is at a premium, uh, it'll just clear out those oldest files that you haven't retrieved yet, those old snapshots from the oldest date possible. So it's very, very much like Time Machine, um, but we will just leave this at default for now. 20% is fine. Alert threshold is then presumably when the NAS will tell us it's got to 80% full and we will get an alert to tell us that we're running out of storage or getting close to running out of storage. So we'll leave that default as well. Next up, the summary page is just telling us everything that we entered so we can have a quick look back at our options. I'm pretty happy with everything we've selected here. As I say, first time setting up a QNAP NAS, so doing this from, you know, sort of not a great deal of knowledge, um, but I'm pretty happy with these options and I think this will do us okay. We can always start again and reconfigure the NAS if it's not performing how I want it to perform or if I've done something incorrectly. So that's exactly why we're making this series. I can dive back in and I can show you guys exactly what I did wrong. Um, interesting how it notes that it'll make some default shares or several default shares it claims it'll make. Um, so that'll be interesting. We'll see what happens there. But anyway, let's just continue and OK. And it will now create the storage pool. So we're already up to nearly 50%. It's really quick at making this storage pool. I can hear the disks crunching away behind me. Um, it's just doing its thing. We've got a little illustration over here of our unallocated space and our alert level. And this interface is really nice. It tells you absolutely everything you need to know. I guess when it's created, it will be able to drop this down and expand information further. Aha, here we go. We can double click and we can take a look at the pool. One thing I'm finding quite interesting is in the background, this NAS is downloading a load of stuff and doing things on its own, basically. So there's a malware scanner that it's downloaded, scan the system, scan is complete, all sorts of things popping up. I could see these little notifications down here, just like that and we have the notifications listed here. So yeah, it's very clear about everything that it's doing. Quite interesting because I haven't told it to do any of that at the moment, but um, 
I don't really have a problem with any of this, so I guess that's absolutely fine. It's really convenient. And just like that, we're done. Our storage pool is up and running. It's created three default shares, and this is also where we can add a new share. So we'll do that a little bit later on. First of all, though, I want to get these SSDs doing something. So I think the best thing to do, we've got five high capacity hard drives and we've got two lower capacity SSDs. I think the best thing for us to do is set them up as an SSD cache right now to see exactly how much performance we get with that. Um, I'm not sure if it's the best way forward for video editing, really not sure, but we'll do that and we'll see how the system performs. So let's click on cache acceleration and we should be able to set this up with both of our SSDs, I think. Check out this little note. ZFS ensures that files are sequentially written to the cache, so SSD over-provisioning is not required. How cool is that? Okay, so let's continue setting up this SSD cache, and it spotted our SSDs right away, SSD1, SSD2. For our cache type, we do have a ZFS NAS here, so we can choose this fancy ZIL synchronous IO log. Wow, that's a mouthful, isn't it? Can increase random write performance. To enable the write log, you must select an even number of disks to change the cache type after cache, blah, 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 blah. So this will, it won't be a true write cache, but it will increase the random write performance. So we'll go for it. First time for everything. First first time of first many, many firsts today. So let's just select that one. It's big words and I don't know what half of them mean. So let's do it like that. Aha, this is interesting. So I did not know that you selected the SSD caching either enabled or disabled per share. So that is definitely really interesting. You can just choose to accelerate a certain share if you like, which is really cool. So. I presume if I create a new share after creating the SSD cache, then I will be able to change that later on. We'll just leave them all enabled for now. Maybe it would be a wiser decision to only select the share that we're actually editing to and from. Um, but we'll wait and see how that pans out. So this appears to be quite an important option. Cache mode, random IO, recommended for virtualization and database applications. So that is not us. All IO, recommended for file serving and media streaming. Now that's a little bit closer to what we're doing. We're not streaming media as such, but we will be actively playing back from the NAS. So in that sense, yes, we're streaming media. Um, but we are indeed serving files, serving a lot of video data. Now it does say as well, your cache should be quicker. Uh, only select all IO if your cache read performance is better than the pool read performance. The cache read performance will indeed be better. They're two SSDs, uh, whereas the drives will definitely be slower. So we'll go for all IO on this one. Let's hit next. And here we go, another summary of all of the options we've selected to create this SSD cache. So I think we'll go ahead and create this. I can't really see any areas where we've slipped up, not at first glance anyway. So we'll create this and this is just a little warning about data loss, removing an SSD, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool, I understand. We're not gonna go yanking anything out. So that's absolutely fine. So again, similarly to creating a storage pool, uh, we are creating here our SSD cache. What's cool is the read RAID type for the cache is RAID 0. So both of those disks will be giving us sort of, you know, double the read speed of a single SSD, which is nice. That's going to be quite a speedy read cache. Interested to know how much that's actually going to help us with video editing. But we can do some research on that. We'll do our own research in terms of real world performance. And I'll also look into this a little bit deeper as well to see if that is the best option for us here. Because we only have a total of one terabyte of SSD. I don't see really a way that we can use them any better. Because if we create another storage pool with the SSDs and say, okay, maybe this is our uh, scratch disk. If we're going to run those in anything other than RAID 0, we're not going to have a great deal of capacity. But then again, RAID 0 on SSDs is a lot less risky. Hmm, this is really kind of an interesting one to ponder over, but we'll see how it performs set up like this 
first. So our cache is created. It took next to no time. A um, bit of a running theme with this NAS. Nothing is taking very long at all. And an entire step that is removed is the volume creation. Um, we will now go and make a shared folder directly on the storage pool, which is wonderful. So let's go and give that a go. So this is our overview of the SSD caching. Once we start storing data on the NAS, we'll see some statistics here. So let's jump back into where we were before. As you guys can see, the interface overall is very, very detailed at every stage. You get absolutely everything laid out here in front of you, all the information on your drives. This is a very cool visual representation of exactly what is in what bay. It'll even tell you the empty ones, of course, the SSDs, everything like that. Very nice. So let's create a new shared folder and see how that goes. I'm interested to know if we can then enable the cache on that folder now that we've already created the SSD cache, if we, if we can do it in that order. Um, so we'll just create one shared folder for now, and this will be our kind of primary do everything share. So for some of my other systems, I've got a few different shares for different things. I've got things separated out quite extensively, but for this, because we're only gonna be using this NAS for video editing, it's not really gonna be that necessary for us to make several different shares. We'll just roll with one share for now. So let's go ahead and get started. So I've been having a think about what I actually wanna call this share because I haven't yet thought about the way I'm gonna organize the data. This is all kind of new. So I think what I'm gonna call it is active projects. And then this way, I know that this share is anything that I'm working on right now or the bulk of the the final cut library this is where stuff kind of resides so i think the active projects um share makes the most sense to begin with here now we get to select what kind of size we want it to be out of our available capacity we're going to leave this on thin provisioning so that they, uh, space is allocated to this share on demand rather than reserving the space using thick provisioning um, we're just going to keep it as kind of flexible as possible here. So use thin provisioning. Um, but I guess this then becomes a maximum value. I'm going to bump this up to 10 terabytes just because we want loads of space and I'm not going to be storing much else on here. So I may as well. Uh, we might be able to change that later on. We probably can. We're going to leave most of these options completely stock because uh, I'm not going to go fiddling with stuff that I'm not 100% sure about. But we will turn off compression because I believe performance overall will be impacted. Um, there may not be a direct difference in actual performance, but it could be the case where the NAS is working more in the background to actually compress that data in a situation where we really don't need to. So if this was a general purpose share, um, data that was going to be stored on here for a long time, then by all means get it compressed and you'll end up with more storage at the end. But for us, we don't need to worry about compression here. Deduplication is not available to us anyway because, as it states here, it requires 16 gigs of RAM. So that's an example. Like I said in part one of this series, certain features in ZFS, is they're going to need a lot of RAM. So this is an example of one of those features. You can't use deduplication with only 8 gigs of RAM. Under performance, we have the SSD cache enabled. So I guess that answers my question from earlier. Our cache is there. Yeah, that's not a problem. And also we have the fast clone option enabled, which according to this information here, means that transferring this data between one share to another within the NAS itself will be quicker. So that is again another ZFS benefit. Everything else we're gonna leave the same. And next, access privileges for this share. We've only got our admin users set up. That's just reminded me we will need to set up a standard user for myself on here that is not the admin, so that's fine for now. Um, of course, we can change all that later. So we've got all sorts of options here. Uh, one that stands out at me is the Time Machine option. If you wanted to use this as Time Machine for Mac OS, you can specifically state that here. Uh, we're gonna disable the Windows Preview option. We don't need that. Uh, there's some guest stuff up here you can configure. I think we can leave everything else pretty much the same. So having a quick read over the summary, everything looks okay to the best of my knowledge. Um, I've set this up to, again, just like the other settings that we applied earlier, 
everything that I think is right at this stage, I'm basically enabling. So that's absolutely fine. We're just gonna run with that. We've got a message here about content source folders doesn't apply to us, so we won't show that message again. And here it goes, creating that shared folder. And boom, quick as a flash, just like everything, we are up and running. So we have our little lightning bolt underneath the new shared folder that we've created that says that the cache is working. So yeah, it just populates automatically under the cache acceleration um, preference here. So you can see that that share we've just created is now up and running. So that's brilliant. Um, that was kind of the big question I had was, is there a specific order that you've got to do this in? But apparently not. It seems extremely flexible. Um, so this share right now, we have permission to access it as an admin. So something really quite exciting. Let's just try and access it right now from my Mac. Um, let's see if we need to do anything else. I don't think we do. If we go into Finder and have a little look at our network devices, our new server is indeed listed. So we have Gallifrey. We'll connect as the admin for now. So connect as, connect, admin, and the password that we set up for our admin account on the server. And there are our shares. Our shares are all listed. Now, because we've logged in as the admin, uh, we can see all of the shares that the NAS has created automatically for us as well. But what we can do later on is when we actually create my user, my Tom user, I can just select the shares that I actually need access to uh, from my other system. So it'll look a little cleaner here. Um, so we've got a folder and we've now mounted that share. This is our video editing share, our active project. Let's just try and copy something to it. These are the screen recordings that I'm actually making for you guys right now. So this file, let's take a look at the size of it. It's 2.14 gigs, so not a tiny file, but not a big file by any means. Let's just drop it onto the NAS. And... Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> okay. was that? I really thought we'd need to do a lot more fiddling to see those kinds of speeds. Um, I think I've got to have a little play with this and see what it does. running files back and forth and also doing a couple of cheeky speed tests and I am really impressed. Now of course we won't know the full story until I actually configure the NAS as my video editing destination and we start editing um, but the early signs all look fantastic. Now what I think we'll do is we do have a little bit more configuration to do on the NAS before we jump in and try some editing. But first of all, I think we should take a look at the switch as a little bit of a change. We've been configuring the NAS for a little while now. Let's dive into the switch, fiddle with some settings in there, or at least have a little look at them. And then we can go back to the NAS and take a little look at what's going on. We can also have a look at these SFP plus ports and see if there's anything in the switch that is stopping us from using our SFP plus ports with my SFP port on my other switch. Just like last time, we are gonna pull up QFinder Pro and we should see our NAS that we've configured. Here we go, there's Gallifrey. And we also see the switch. So it's showing us both of the QNAP devices on our network. This is reminding us about SMTP. We will set that up a little bit later on, but uh, it's not really high on the priority list at the moment. We've got a couple of other things that we need to get sorted. We haven't even made a, a user for ourselves yet on the NAS. But like I said, let's jump into the switch and have a quick look at the switch before we move on, just as a little bit of a change of pace here. So this is the login page for the QNAP switch system, QSS. We've got an admin account on here already, it seems. So let's have a little look at what the password could be. Let's try a couple of standard passwords. Admin, admin, admin password. No password at all, possibly. Login, no. Okay, 
Um, I think the best thing to do is pull up the manual for the switch and have a little look. I've managed to really quickly pull up the manual for this switch simply by going to my switch product page on the QNAP website, going to the download center, and then clicking on the manual and doing a quick search for default password reveals that this is going to be the MAC address of our switch. So that's really easy. We can use QFinder Pro again to have a look at the MAC address for our switch and then that'll just give us our password straight away. With the MAC address entered, let's give that a go. And ha ha, here we go. This is our new password. So we'll enter a password for the switch. Okay. This is now our password and we should be able to log in with our new password. Here we go. So we are in and we can see right away we have some information on the screen about our switch. So on the top left, we have our port status. We just get a nice basic illustration here of the ports and whether they're active or not. So these are the three ports that we currently have active. Over here, we have system information. So just some default information about the switch. And down here, we have a little graph showing us some of the traffic in and out of the switch. All very simple here on the home page. So down the left hand side, you can see we have our column with all of our various layer two management options. We've got port management, VLAN, link aggregation, all sorts down the side. We can just click on these and have a little look. We've got our VLANs, link aggregation. So it looks like you can make six group, six lag groups for this eight port switch. That's really quite cool. One thing that we are going to take a look at right away is port management. We will see if we can do anything about uh, this port number one that we tried to use for our link to my current switch. Aha, so as we can see, all of these ports are currently set to auto. And if we go on the drop down, we can indeed change the speed. So each port has auto or 10 gig, 5 gig, 2.5 gig or 1 gig. What's interesting is we can't actually do the drop down for the first four ports. So if we look at the switch here, we've got four ports. These are the SFP plus ports. And then we've got four RJ45s. All of the RJ45s, we can alter the speed. Um, but we can't on the SFP plus ports, which is interesting. So for any of you that are curious as to why I'm looking at this right now, the main reason is because in order to get my, um, my old switch chatting to an SFP plus port, I had to manually drop the speed of the SFP plus port down to one gig, and then it would communicate because it's only standard SFP ports on my switch. I thought it may be a similar situation here, but it turns out that you can only have these SFP plus ports on auto. Uh, let's have a little look at the information here. Aha, yeah, it even says applies only to RJ45. So you can't actually change the speed of the SFP plus ports. So that may mean that they're 10 gig only, but I'm gonna have to check that out. I'll have a quick look in the manual, see if I can see anything. Um, I may actually get in touch with QNAP as well, just to double check on that one. But it looks like we can't drop these down to one gig manually. You can't force them down to one gig. So my little theory there is not gonna work to get that link up and running, but that's not a problem. Everything else is looking absolutely fine. So very nice and basic, clear to understand interface. We've got general system settings down the bottom here, all the things you'd expect to be able to change. We can do a static IP here as well for the switch, which is really nice. Uh, all sorts of usual stuff, firmware update options down here. Yeah, really nice basic interface uh, and log off, log on. Let's just check that one more time. Yes, perfect. So we now have access to the switch. That's great. As you guys can see, that couldn't be simpler really. That is really, really straightforward. Um, and I think it's good to point out that we don't need to do anything with the switch to get this setup up and running. It is, it seems to be performing absolutely fine right out of the box. So for my needs here, we're not really gonna need to adjust anything within the switch, at least not straight away. So that's great. I'm really chuffed with how straightforward all of this is turning out to be. So that is the quick look at the switch configuration and QSS, QNAP switch system. We've had a little kind of mini tour around there. We won't delve into all of the features, um, but there we have it. Our switch is now 
up and running or it was up and running anyway but at least now we have access to it we've essentially kind of provisioned it i guess you can say because we now have our own little account and we can we can get on there so that's good i have just logged back on to gallifrey and it's brought up the help center again i'm going to ask it not to do this but very handy if you do need a helping hand through this stuff there is a help center right here on the NAS. So um, we, we're kind of sort of for the click around and figure it out ourselves team, um, but it is useful. So we are now gonna set up a user, set up the priv privileges for the user, figure out a couple more final little details and get this ready to actually try some editing to and from. Right now we are behaving as the admin user and the admin is essential for administration, but for our day-to-day -day use, we want a little bit of more of a simplified user with access to less of the shares. So particularly those default shares, we don't really want to see those. So if we take a look here within Finder, we're going to solve a couple of things today. Under network, we'll notice that we've got Gallifrey, but we've also got Gallifrey AFP. We'll sort that out. And if we connect to Gallifrey, because we're connecting as the admin at the moment, we can see all of these shares, whereas really I only want to see my share that I actually created. So that's not a problem at all. Let's go and figure out some of this stuff. So if we launch control panel, I think this is a good place to start to dive in and have a look at some of these settings. We're gonna go into network and file services because there is something that I wanna disable on this particular NAS. We're gonna come down to win slash max slash NFS and this references back to that option that we selected earlier. Will you be using this NAS with a Mac, a PC? Um, and this is the settings that have been applied because of the answers that we gave. Now then, we only really need to use one network protocol with this NAS. Currently, as you can see from Finder, we do have a couple of different network protocols set up and it's easy to tell because we have Gallifrey listed here, the one that we've connected to, and we have Gallifrey AFP. Now AFP stands for Apple File Protocol and I use AFP extensively on my network, but we don't need to use AFP for this NAS. We can disable it because Final Cut Pro, although it's an Apple application, Final Cut Pro doesn't rely on AFP. It relies on SMB3 as the best protocol to use for editing over the network. So I believe, judging by the fact that this is labeled as AFP, I believe that this share that we're connected to is indeed the SMB3 share. Now taking a look up here under the Microsoft services, coming into advanced options, we can see that we do have SMB3 enabled. Highest SMB version SMB3 or SMB1. We can just leave that as it is because it will default to SMB3 anyway. We can come over and we can actually disable AFP. Once we uncheck this box and we apply the settings, we should see that AFP disappear from our finder window. So that will just help to streamline things a little bit more. Leaving it on is no problem at all, but it may get confusing if you accidentally connect to that and then it's not working properly with Final Cut. We only wanna focus on SMB. So if we come back over into network, you can see that we now only have Gallifrey enabled. So AFP is not enabled, so that's perfect for us now. As I say, not a problem, but we only really wanna focus on SMB. So it's confusing, it's under the Microsoft tab, um, but still, that's the one we want. Uh, NFS, we don't have to worry about that anyway, so that's all good. So that's that sorted. Next up, we wanna go back into control panel, and we wanna now create our appropriate user that we're gonna be using to edit to and from the NAS. Let's jump into users, and we're gonna add a new user. Looks like from the drop down here, you can create multiple users at one time if you want to, but we only need to create one user. So just like creating a user account for anything, we've got options for name and password and a little picture and everything. So I'm just gonna fill in these details. So there's my basic information entered. You can do some stuff with email down here, send an email notification, that's really cool. We wanna edit some of the folders that this user can and can't see. So to do that, we'll jump in here and we can currently see that for our active projects, we don't have any access right now. So 
we actually want read and write access to that one. So it goes green when we go for read and write. We don't want access to any of these other folders. I'm not really gonna use the public folder, I'm not gonna use any of them, they can just sit there. So that's fine, the active projects folder, the active projects share is now read and write for our user. There's also a deny column here, so we can deny access to the public folder if we want, but there's no real need. I don't need to further configure this, so we can just create that user. And what I'm gonna try and do now is log out of the admin account on my Mac and we'll log into Tom Smith. So I can still see all of this, which is interesting. I was expecting those to disappear. So the only reason we're doing this is to try and make it a little less cluttered. Um, let's try and edit this. So I've just restarted my Mac because I was relaunching Finder to try and refresh things, but it was still showing me exactly the same stuff. So let's jump back in. Aha, okay, things have refreshed slightly better now. I can actually see all of my servers. I do find the, this whole network portion of Finder in Big Sur to be a little bit on the old buggy side, um, but we'll see if we can see those folders now. It will be interesting. We'll connect as Tom Smith. Okay, we can still see all of those folders. Interesting, because on my other systems, as soon as you uh, disallow access to those shares from the user account, then you can't see them anymore. But I'm guessing if we try and connect to any of these, they're not gonna work because that's what we've specified. Let's have a look. Yeah, not gonna work, not gonna work not gonna work, but the one that we have specified is right there. So they still show up. I'm gonna have one last go at trying to hide these default shares. It's no big deal at all, but I just wanna see if I can do it now that I'm already down the rabbit hole. So I'm gonna have a quick click around in the control panel here, see if I can see anything. So looking at the shares here in the control panel, I can edit them and there is an option to hide them. Hide network drive. Now, because we're using SMB, I think this should work. All services will be temporarily suspended. That's fine. So you've got hidden, no, yes, no, no. So let's hide all of these. Okay, so that may have done the trick. Let's disconnect from Gallifrey. Let's reconnect as Tom Smith. And with a bit of luck, boom, there we go. So we have our active projects folder. We've got a home folder here. We can't do anything with it. It's not in this list. There's a difference between homes and home, it seems. So not too sure there, as I say, new to QNAP, so not 100% sure, but we've actually managed to achieve that now, which is great. Worth noting as well, if you do want to still connect to these shares, you can hide them but you can still manually connect to them by entering the share. So that's excellent. So what I'm gonna do now is I am going to plop a Final Cut library onto our NAS. We are gonna start doing things properly. So on our active project share, new, and we are gonna go libraries, and we will take our little external SSD here, which is the drive I've been using to edit all of my videos for a good few years now. Within the Scratch, we do have a March library, do we not? No, we don't, we do not. So we're only just into March, 8th of March. So every project that I've got has been started in February. So that's great. What we'll do is we'll start a brand new March library on the NAS, and then I'll move my current project over to that new library. So let's launch Final Cut Pro. So this is an event open here, uh, part one of our QNAP series from the Feb library. We're gonna create the March library. Now, typically what I do when I come into a new month is I'd create library, and then I'd just come here and I'd make a new library and we'd be away to go for the month. But we're gonna change that up a little bit now. We're gonna use our network share. So let's choose Gallifrey, Active Projects, Libraries, 2021, March. And all of these ones that are dated and months and things like that, they are my IMNC libraries. So that's the library created. If we go over into our Finder window, we can see in libraries, we now have a new library file. Now coming over here, we can look at our storage locations and there are a couple of different options here. So these are the four different areas in Final Cut where we can specify individual locations. Now we've got media, motion content, cache and backups. The backups first, we'll sort of go from the bottom up, I guess. Backups, Final Cut backups folder by default is always the local movies folder on your Mac. 
Now, I keep this as default because it's a very, very small folder and all I do every now and again is I empty it and delete the backups. It's not a problem at all. It keeps the project backups completely separate from your working folder, your library, so it is then kind of a true backup of that project. I'll actually show you that folder. So if we take a little example and look at my edits here, if we go back into Scratch, back into my February library, you can see it's a big old library for the videos that I've made during Feb and the videos that I'm currently making. Um, however, if we go down into movies, we have a folder called Final Cut Backups and you can see the backups for the different libraries, but this entire folder is just over 200 megs. So it's absolutely nothing for all of these months work. So I just leave the backups on the system drive. That isn't a problem at all. Next up is the motion templates. For me, I don't even use it, so I don't need to change it. Motion templates there, you can see stored in the folder again in the local movies folder. Cache is quite an important one. At the moment, you guys can see that it's stored in volumes, active projects, libraries, because it's defaulted to store on the NAS. That's where our library is stored. You can, if you want, store your cache locally. You can store the cache locally and you can have your library on the NAS. That will speed things up, but the only thing with that is you will have to consciously remember to clear that cache from your system drive. It will go up and up and up in size. But we are gonna keep it in the library because I think this NAS is quick enough to have the cache on the NAS as well. I believe the NAS is a little bit quicker from what I've observed from my file transfers. I believe it's a little bit quicker than my external SSD as it is. So, Cache in library, we're gonna roll with that for now. We can always change it later. And the final one is the media itself. It's gonna be stored in the library, of course. So these are all our storage locations. We haven't needed to change any from default. They're all just sitting there quite happily. Let's hit okay on that. You get a little rundown of your locations here as well in the inspector, that's great. We will now move a project over to the NAS. And I think the first project that I'm gonna move over is one that I haven't edited yet. I've got this Mac mini SSD replacement video. I have a project, I've got footage, but I've got no edit at all. The project is empty. So I believe this video, which is quite a lot of footage here because I was filming the entire time I was doing the upgrade. I think what I'm gonna do is use this project as my first ever kind of guinea pig NAS editing project. I can give this a go later on in the week. So let's move this over to the new library. Now, if you're upgrading from your current storage solution to the NAS and you wanna move a library over, or you wanna move an event over specifically, we've already created a new library. You can move the entire library over as well, that's fine. You can just copy it over. But to move the event, we can just drag that over. Mac mini SSD upgrade into March. Include absolutely everything to be transferred over. So we can see it's now copying the file over to the NAS and I can actually tell that it's doing so as well because I can hear the drive spinning up behind me and copying that data over. This is quite a lot of data for us to get an idea of, of what we're copying over. Unfortunately, Final Cut isn't very descriptive in the background tasks window, but we can get a rough idea by looking that up ourselves. So to see how much it's copying over, we can come over into Scratch. We can look at our February library and we can show the contents of this folder and we can come down into the video that we're talking about. So the video in question is the Mac mini SSD upgrade. Looking at the original media folder, if we look at the size of that folder, you guys can see that we're copying over 43 gigabytes over to the NAS. So that's what Final Cut is doing right now. When it's finished copying that 43 gigs of data over, we'll then be able to edit freely in this library, and that'll be our first edit on this NAS. 100% done, we are finished. So I am now gonna completely quit final cut because we are going to prove here that we have done everything correctly um, by ejecting hyperspace. This is my external SSD that I use to edit my videos. Let's relaunch final cut. It's going to give us a couple of errors that it can't open libraries that were previously located on that other drive. However, what we will have is our library Oh, it's not even making a fuss about those libraries. That's pretty cool. So March is the only one that it's been able to open. This is the only one that we actually have stored here. Let's open the project. We are now completely disconnected from the SSD, so that means we're editing live from the NAS. So the first clip in that video, you guys can't actually see my uh, playback window here, my viewer, because it's on my second display, but we don't really need to watch the video. I just need to drag it into the timeline and see what it does. So first clip, drag into the timeline, boom. Here we are, video in the timeline. Scroll back and forth. It's loading it up. Let's dump another clip. Dump another clip. Let's reduce the timeline, have a little look. Scrub, 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 scrub. Scrub, scrub, scrub. Okay. And another one. It's all here. It's all here. 
chop, 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 chop. So let's just pretend we chop, chop, make an edit, make an edit, bang. Yeah, edit, edit, cut this together. I can see all of this previewing, by the way. I tell you what, let's just add all of these clips simultaneously. Drop those in, reduce that. Whoa, okay. So, it's all doing its thing. I'm gonna play a little bit back, put my headphones on. It's playing back. It's playing back. Oh my gosh. That feels identical, maybe even a little bit better than my SSD that I've had connected via USB 3.0. It's only a little MSATA thing. It's not the fastest thing in the world. Um, so yes, that is our first very non-scientific but quick kind of concept theory test here of the editing to and from this NAS. We actually have it set up. Now for anyone that may be slightly disappointed and thinking, come on Tom, show us some real numbers, get down to the nitty gritty. As well as setting this up and making it all pretty in part three in the rack, the main thing that we're gonna do in part three, I'm gonna run some proper numbers. I'll do some comparisons, some real speed tests, some real life world performance and we will see the differences in terms of numbers. This part two here is all configuration, it's all just me figuring out how to do this. But I think this is a massive success. As we go through this configuration process, all of my questions are being answered, and I now have the answer to the first question that popped up in this video, and that is the connection between the two switches using this cable. Now I checked directly with QNAP, I asked the question because I noticed in the switch as you guys saw that you couldn't manually assign speed to the SFP Plus ports, I wondered if they would only run at 10 gig. They will drop down to 1 gig, but you must use standard SFP 1 gig transceivers. So this is a 10 gig SFP Plus DAC cable. Now with my other switch, what I was able to do to get it chatting to my Dream Machine Pro was within the Dream Machine Pro, I was able to drop that down from 10 gig to one gig. It wouldn't work as an auto assign. I had to manually set it to one gig FDX and then it worked. I've been doing a little bit of forum searching and a lot of people, a lot of users, if they have one of these switches, the non-pro versions with only the SFP ports, a lot of people have trouble getting those ports talking to different pieces of equipment because they're SFP ports and it's a complete pain. So we're not gonna be able to get this up and running. I'm pretty sure this is not gonna work. I'm not gonna waste any more time on it because there's nothing much I can really do. I've looked at it on the QNAP switch side. I can't do anything there, as you guys saw. There's nothing to be done because if I was plugging the correct cable into the QNAP, then it would just work anyway. On the other side, on my standard switch that I've had for ages, there's nothing that's showing up there. It's just a completely dead port. I can't do anything with it. It's a one gig port anyway, so I can't adjust the speed. So we are gonna just leave it with RJ45. We have four RJ45 ports to play with on the QNAP switch, and that will work out for us completely fine. Lovely, another question answered. We've got it straight from the horse's mouth. They will work with one gig, but you need the right stuff. One huge benefit to editing locally is the simplicity. One of the things that makes it so simple is the fact that the files are always there for you. So every time you turn on your Mac, as long as the storage is connected to the machine, all the files and the libraries and the projects that you were working on last time will be there for you straight away. You just have to launch Final Cut and anything you were working on last time just springs back to life and you can begin working on it instantly. This is just a process that we don't think about because it's common practice. You switch on your computer and any locally connected disks will just mount straight away. It's something that we've all become accustomed to. Now with a server or a network share, it's a little bit different. You physically have to tell your machine to mount that share so that you you can begin working on it. Now, if I shut down my Mac right now, I'm connected to my active project share right here, so I can launch Final Cut if I want to. I can begin working on anything here straight away. That's not a problem. But as soon as I shut down my Mac and turn my machine back on, if I then launch Final Cut, it'll be empty. Nothing will be there because I physically have to reconnect to this share. To do this every single time you want to edit is a little bit inconvenient to say the least because like I've demonstrated in this video, a good way to connect is just to come into network, click on the server, then you've got to connect, wait for it to load. 
then you've got to click on your share and whatever you're connected. So that's a little bit time consuming. A little bit of a quicker way is you can just press Command K from your keyboard when you're on your desktop within Finder here, and you can connect to any one of the servers on your network and you can select a share and you can go from there. This dialogue is also great for a really quick reference as to whether you're connected to an AFP or an SMB share, by the way. So that plays into where we were last time. You can see that I do have an SMB share for Gallifrey as well as the older AFP share that we disabled. But still, that's an extra step that you've got to remember to do prior to launching Final Cut and it's just a little bit of a pain. Now we can replicate the behavior of locally attached storage by telling the machine to mount these drives or rather to connect to these network shares when we start up the machine. And it's really easy to do this and you've all probably used this feature without knowing it anyway. So we go into users and groups within system preferences and over here under the login items tab, this is typically where you drag any application that you want to boot up when you load your machine. So if you always want messages to come up, you pop messages in here and that app opens by default. Pretty standard stuff. But one really cool feature is you don't just have to add applications to this list. You can add pretty much anything. One of those things being the network share. So we can go into Gallifrey. We can click on the share that we want to automatically mount. We can add it and it is now in that list. That means when I restart my Mac or I turn my Mac on for the first time that morning, it will reconnect the share. And as long as we are connected, we can launch Final Cut and we can begin editing. Now this brings me on to my next point. By default these days, Mac OS does not show shares on the desktop, I don't believe. From a fresh install, you don't get all of your options showing on the desktop. You may get uh, you get external DVDs and USB and stuff. I don't think you get connected servers on by default. So I do recommend coming up to Finder, Preferences, and just enabling all of this stuff. One of the lovely simplistic things about the Mac from day one for me has been the fact that anything connected to your machine, whether it's uh, an internal hard drive, external, USB drive, DVD, network share, they all just appear on the desktop. And I think that's really convenient. So I always enable all of these options as soon as I get a new Mac or I do a fresh install. That way you can then see that the share has been connected to. So when you turn on your Mac, there will be a little bit of a delay, then it'll connect to the share and you'll be good to go. You can then launch Final Cut and carry on editing from where you left off. If you do have hard drives in your NAS, which you most likely will do, just like I have here, there will be a little time where the drives have got to spin up. So if your NAS hasn't been doing much for the past little while and the drives have spun down, the NAS will have to come to life. You will then need to wait to be connected, but it's much more convenient doing that than actually clicking through the process and remembering to do it yourselves. So that's one cool little tip, and that just lets us edit as soon as we switch our machine on. You'll notice behind me that I've got a new kind of little setup going here. This is not permanent. This is a temporary solution using a bit of furniture that I had going spare. I needed to get the printer back up here on the rack. So in order to have the NAS and the printer all stacked up together, I needed to plop that there. I'm not crazy about the way it looks, but I don't have a better solution for now. Because this is a desktop NAS, it's not gonna go in my rack. It'll take up at least five view of space. I don't have the space to dedicate to it. So it's gonna to have to be outside here somewhere and I need to figure out how I'm gonna juggle all this gear around, where I'm gonna put it. Do I need to buy an additional piece of furniture or I need to think about all that. I've got some ideas, but that's not the main thing I wanna talk about here in the outro. What I wanna tell you guys right now is something so cool. I've just jumped off the edit of this very video, part two, the video that you're watching right now. I've just this second come off the edit and I've edited the last three quarters of this video on the QNAV NAS. After doing the introduction in the first little section, I transferred the library because of course, after we configured it, it was ready to rock. So I transferred the library over to the QNAP and the last three quarters of the video, I've been editing to and from this NAS, which has been incredible. It's been a buttery smooth experience. And up to this point, the library is just under 200 gigs. I think it's 190 something gigabytes. So it's not a small, project by any means, quite a large project, especially for me. I rarely exceed 200 gigs in one video project for IMNC, and this is just chewing through all of it. Really speedy, really happy. Now, I'm not gonna show you any numbers in this part two. I haven't done any tests. I've only just edited a video and kind of assessed what it feels like, but I haven't run the raw numbers. I need to take a look and do all that for you guys ready for part three. I am really interested to see just how quick this guy is on paper because it feels great. And I was expecting to jump into the configuration another three or four times and tweak this and tweak that. I've always had this kind of association with 10 gig and fiddling and tweaking and stuff, but no, I've just plugged it in. 
switched it on, pressed the buttons that I thought were the correct ones to press, and we are up and running with a really speedy network. Now, of course, I'm not saying that the configuration that I've put in place is perfect, and it's very early days still, but over the next few days, I'm gonna be hammering this guy, and in preparation for part three especially, we'll really put it through its paces to see what it can do. So that's a good place to wrap up, I think. I'll show you guys all of the stuff that we've got left. We'll tie up all of the loose ends in part three. I really hope you've enjoyed this part two, the configuration of this equipment. It's been great fun, and I'm so glad that the project is going this well. Hopefully, you'll all be able to join me in part three as well. So thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time. Music